Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez Parrilla presented the annual report regarding the impact of the U.S. blockade against the Iceland. U.S. candidates Trump and Biden to clash in the last debate before presidential elections. The African Union has condemned the violent events in Nigeria. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is From the South, I'm Gladys Quesada. This Thursday, the Cuban Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez Parrilla presented the annual report regarding the consequences of the economic, commercial and financial blockade of the United States against Cuba. The report serves to set the grounds for Cuba's proposal before the UN General Assembly for the United States to cede its blockade's policy towards the island. Support for the Cuban proposal is overwhelming in the General Assembly, where the U.S. has been practically isolated from the international community. The Trump the administration has implemented more than 100 measures to strengthen the blockade. This year reports show that Cuba has suffered losses of more than 922 billion US dollars due to the impact of the US blockade. From April 2019 to March 2020, that is the period that we used to quantify the damages made by the blockade and present this report that I'm doing right here today for the public opinion, for the international community, and especially for our people on the implementation of the blockade that has been sent to the Secretary General of the United Nations and that will be published very soon and therefore establishes that cycle. I can I can let you know that the blockade in this time has caused losses to Cuba in over $5.7 billion. It's the first time that the damages of the blockade surpasses the number of $5 billion. The blockade has established and establishes today to our people, to our government, a challenge, an additional challenge to face the pandemic that is ravaging the world right now. The efficient development of our people and our government facing the COVID-19 can only be explained by the strength of the Cuban health system, the strength of the scientific potential that we have developed, and the implication that direct and motivated of our citizens, of our of Cuban families, of our people, in the fight against the pandemic. The report that we are presenting denounces with grounds, with unrefutable evidence, the strengthening of, U of blockade policy between 2019 and 2020. That is a period that is marked at the same time by an increase of hostilities of U.S. policy against our people and all sovereign states. This Wednesday night, Bolivian Deputy Andrea Barrientos and political activist Samantha Nogales, both from the Citizen Community Coalition Party, were assaulted. The attack took place in Cochabamba when an extreme right group named Cochala Youth, sponsored by Luis Fernando Camacho, who lost in the regional general elections, was contesting the electoral results. The politicians reported that as they approached the vicinity of the polling center from the Departmental Electoral Tribunal in Cochabamba to dialogue with a group of citizens protesting against the electoral outcome, they were insulted and assaulted with objects, one of which impacted Samantha Nogales as she was making a statement to the media covering the demonstration. Deputy Barrientos regret that Coachella Youth Resistance and the We Believe Party are calling for violence while reminding that so far no observations have been raised against the electoral count.
and Epsilon Storm has gathered strength on Wednesday night and now has become a major Category 3 hurricane, according to the last bulletin issued by the Hurricane National Center as it approaches to the Bermuda's Islands. Carrying maximum sustained wind speeds of 115 miles per hour, the hurricane is now located 200 miles southeast of Bermuda's and continues its advance through the Atlantic Ocean according to the trajectory projected by the United States National Hurricane Center. Bermudas will not be directly hit by Epsilon, although it will feel its rage. Dangerous swells generated by the hurricane kept Bermudas on high alert, as well as the Bahamas, the Lesser Antilles, and the Leeward Islands. With less than three days to go until the constitutional referendum in Chile, offering the possibility of redrafting the constitution inherited from the Augusto Pinochet dictatorship, the electoral atmosphere is not so noticeable in the street as the demonstrations and intense police control. Our correspondent, Paola Dragnik, has the details on the ground. To one side, the so-called political class. The Christian Democratic Party hands out electoral material to his polling station representatives for the constitutional referendum on October 25th. We need to unite all the sectors. There are even center-right sectors that have joined the Yes Vote campaign. On the other side, outside La Moneda Presidential Palace, relatives of those detained during the October protest who remain in prison, only Channel 3 provides coverage. They have been serving their pre-trial detention in the high-security prison for almost a year with despicable treatment. They are allowed out in the yards for just a couple of hours per day. And here, in the neighborhood of Villa Frey in Ñuñoa, police officers control and arrest leaders and mobilize residents practically every day. In the streets, there is almost no propaganda about the option to vote yes or not in the referendum, but the demonstrations continue. Everything is in dispute. Nothing is won. We have to win on the 25th. It's the first step. And then the more complex task opens up, which is to elect genuine representatives of the social movement, the popular movement that made this scenario possible. Also, maintaining the strengthening of the organization in the territories, a fundamental element, considering that the social mobilization was the only possibility of opening towards a constitutional referendum to change the constitution inherited from the dictatorship. If we stop the social mobilization, there are no guarantees of social transformation in this country. But it is a social mobilization that does not seem to be fully accommodated within the current political powers, the same that in the midst of the social unrest during 2019, quickly tried to calm the mood by offering the people a constitutional referendum. A constituent process that is full of traps, limitations and obstacles, but despite these fronts, this has been achieved thanks to pressure from below, although there are many obstacles to overcome, because we know well that the formula provided by the political case, on the spur of the moment, behind the backs of the citizens, I refer to the agreement of November, 20, of November 15, 19, 2019, for social peace and the new constitution. It is a pact aimed at eliminating popular sovereignty and preventing it from being fully expressed. Law 21.200, which enables the possibility of a constitutional referendum, even decides what the so-called constitutional convention can do. It partially marginalizes independence, establishes a supraclassified quorum of two-thirds, and prohibits the modification of international agreements, such as those on free trade. I hope that the popular movement has the political intelligence to transform the Constitutional Convention into a constituent assembly. That could be done if a great social mobilization is maintained. The majority of effectively progressive delegates are elected that declare, they that declare the Convention free and sovereign, which is equivalent to converting it, to converting it into a constitutional assembly. If that does not happen, we will have a new constitution, but this will be nothing more than a superficial change to the current model and the current constitution. We have to include the organized, self-convened people to achieve a constituent assembly. We are recently approaching the concepts of popular sovereignty, of constituent power, 
but there is still a long way to go. The first step is to win this October 25th, not only to secure a yes vote for the reform, but also regarding the constitutional convention that contemplates that members will be popularly elected. Italo Retamal y Paola Dragnik, Telesur, Chile. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. In only 12 days, the United States will live another one of the most important elections in its recent history. The current president, the Republican Donald Trump, and his challenger, the former Vice President Joe Biden, will clash in the last debate this Thursday night. After the first debate debacle, where Trump interrupted the moderator and Biden several times when he was presumably contagious of COVID-19, and after the second one that was substituted for separated television interviews, now the debate commission decided to mute the other candidate's microphone during the two-minute answer period with the purpose of imposing some discipline on Trump and put pressure on Biden to give clear and complete answers to policy questions. Meanwhile, the veteran Democrat is leading almost every poll with advantage, although the same happened four years ago with Hillary Clinton, and Donald Trump won the presidential elections. And China criticized on Thursday the Trump administration's announcement that it had approved the sale of more than a billion dollars worth of advanced weaponry to Taiwan. The U.S. State Department announced Wednesday it had green-lighted the sale of 135 precision light attack missiles, associated equipment and training to Taiwan to improve its defense capabilities. The package is just worth over a billion dollars, it said in a statement. During Thursday's briefing, Sao also said China was was extending a deal over bishops' appointments with the Catholic Church, and the two sides will maintain close communication and consultations and continue to promote the process of improving relations. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is calling on suspension of conflicts around the world in order to help nations deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. In an exclusive interview with the Associated Press, Guterres said that a global ceasefire is the UN's main concern at the present. He pointed to the conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan, where people infected have mixed with others as they huddle in basements to shelter from the artillery fire. Spain's parliament rejects a non-confidence motion filed by the far-right party Vox against the left-wing coalition government of Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez. The motion was only backed by Vox 52 lawmakers, while with the remaining 298 voted against, including those of the main conservative opposition popular party. After two days of debate, the motion was only backed by Vox 52 lawmakers, with the remaining 298 voting against, including those of the main conservative opposition party. PP leader Pablo Casado had announced earlier that his party's 88 lawmakers will vote against the motion, which he dismissed as pure populism. The motion had piled pressure on the PP, which had to choose between voting against it or to maintain its distance from the far right, or abstaining to keep the peace with Vox electorate. Around 1,000 Indonesian workers gathered in Jakarta to protest against a controversial new investment law which critics say will harm labor rights and the environment. 
Protests against Indonesia's new labor law were held in cities across the country on Tuesday, with demonstrators calling on the president to revoke the legislation they say will erode labor rights and weaken environmental protections. More than 1,000 students and workers gathered near the presidential palace in Jakarta to express their anger to the legislation, which was passed on October 5. Protests were also held in other parts of the country. And the head of the Red Cross team monitoring the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict calls on Azerbaijani and Armenian separatist forces to stop shelling civilians and respect international law in the conflict that has killed nearly 1,000 people. We express that we uh, request the, the sites to respect rules of international humanitarian law. This is very important. Uh, they have to to spare the life of the civilian, civilian infrastructure, uh, because th there has been situations in which they have been using uh, a heavy artillery in uh, populated areas. Important question, and it's very important to clarify that uh, the discussions, negotiations about any ceasefire and any uh, body retrieval operation lies in the responsibility of the sites to the conflict. So they are the ones that have to do all the discussions, negotiations, and agreements. And the ICRC stands ready to play its neutral role uh, when the sites come to an agreement and request our support. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. The African Union has condemned the violence recorded in the last few hours in Nigeria during protests against police brutality that are taking place across the country. In the coastal city of Lagos, human rights organizations claim that some participants have been killed and wounded. Lagos, the second city in Nigeria with the largest demographic growth, witnessed new protests the third days. Religious and cultural events open a peaceful day after the violence registered during the last Tuesday, when besides reports by non-governmental organizations of protesters killed and wounded, several fires and property damage were also reported. Musa Faki Mahmat, president of the African Union Commission, has called all political and social actors to reject violence and respect human rights and the rules of the law. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called on Nigerian authorities to prevent further acts of violence between police forces and peaceful demonstrators following deadly incidents on Tuesday night as Nigerians continue to protest police brutality. 38 seconds. To do so, uh, that police brutality needs to stop and those that are responsible um, uh, for uh, acts uh, of uh, such uh, dramatic violence uh, are made accountable. Uh, and this is essentially essential everywhere. And um, I, I, I trust uh, President Buhari that you, you will be able to bring things uh, into a, a normal way to respect the right of um, assembly of, of people. And the governor of the Nigerian state of Lagos announced on Wednesday that he has ordered an investigation into the shooting of protesters on Tuesday night when shots were fired into a crowd of demonstrators singing the country's national anthem at the Lekki Toll Square in the West African country's probably commercial capital. It is imperative to explain that no sitting governor controls the rules of engagement of the military. I have nonetheless instructed an investigation into the ordered and the adopted rules of engagement employed by the officers and men of the Nigerian army that were deployed to the Lekki toll gate last night. 
The World Health Organization's Regional Director for Africa says that the anticipated large-scale introduction of an antigen-based rapid diagnostic test is a potential game-changer in the continent's fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. African countries are gearing up to introduce antigen-based rapid diagnostic tests on a large scale. And this will be a game changer, we think, in the fight against COVID-19. These high quality rapid tests will help meet the huge unmet need for testing in Africa. We've seen that African countries have faced a significant gap throughout the, the pandemic. For example, Senegal has significantly boosted its testing capacity, but it still has testing 14 times less than the Netherlands. Nigeria is testing 11 times less than Brazil. With rapid testing, authorities can stay a step of uh, COVID-19 ahead by scaling up active case finding in challenging environments like crowded urban neighborhoods and communities out in the countryside. The UN Refugee Agency, along with cohorts, the European Union, the United States and the United Kingdom are holding a virtual conference to urge support for Rohingya refugees and their host communities more than three years after hundreds of thousands fled Myanmar. The agency stressed the need for stronger international support and a redoubling of efforts to find solutions for the stateless and displaced population. The ongoing humanitarian response is facing a dramatic shortfall this year, as less than half of the requested funds have been received so far. In 2020, the United Nations has appealed for more than 1 billion USD to meet the humanitarian needs of Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh. The agency said the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic has added layers of new challenges and needs to already complex and massive refugee emergency. And we have come to the end of this news brief. These and many other stories, you can find them on our website at telesurienglish.net. Also, you can join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.